Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Stephen Giuliano is a distinguished professor of ecology at Illinois State University. Steve is an ecologist who uses mosquitoes that live and breed in containers such as Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, and Culex pipiens to study factors affecting community composition. He has studied the effects of predation and competition on the composition of mosquito communities, among other things. Steve has been recently investigating an interesting phenomena whereby reducing the number of mosquito larvae in an environment can lead to increases in the number of adult mosquitoes. I think you'll hear a bit about this today. Steve teaches courses on ecology, entomology, and biostatistics. John Connolly is the Senior Regulatory Science Officer at Targa Malaria, a not-for-profit research consortium centered at Imperial College and developing gene drive technologies for use in malaria-transmitting mosquitoes for the purposes of reducing the burden of malaria in Africa. In addition to John's expertise in regulatory science, he's also a health policy expert with many years of experience in the United Kingdom's Department of Health and Social Care, where he was concerned with cloning and stem cell policy, regenerative medicine policy, and even pandemic preparedness. John's expertise in regulation and policy rests on scientific research experience in neurogenetics and neurobiology. I'd like to welcome both of you and to thank you for your participation in this webinar series. Steve, you are the first of our presenters today, and I'd like to ask you to go ahead and take the floor. I'll let you know when we can see your presentation and can hear you. Thank you, David. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to talk uh, at this webinar. It uh, looks like a great program. Um, as David's introduction indicated, uh, uh, my area of expertise is ecology, not gene drive mechanisms. So I'm not going to tell you very much about gene drives today. What I am going to talk about is the ecology of container dwelling Aedes and how that might relate to efforts to use gene drive or any other species specific mosquito control technology to limit the disease transmission by these very important vectors. Um, when I give uh, a talk like this to a general audience, I usually start by uh, talking about the burden of disease, uh, particularly arboviruses that um, are transmitted by container dwelling Aedes mosquitoes like Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Not going to talk about that to this group because I think everyone here knows that quite well. What I do want to mention is um, the uh, advantages that might obtain from species specific control of mosquitoes. One of the long term problems with mosquito control is non target effects of chemical pesticides. They um, affect not only a wide array of insects, but other organisms as well. And so, uh, species specific technologies like genetic mechanisms that could control only a target species would have some real advantages um, for limiting disease burden. However, uh, there may be other consequences to suppression of a single species when there is a prominent species interaction like interspecific competition between uh, it and other organisms. And in particular for container dwelling Aedes, the most important thing is there are at least two very important vector species that uh, occur in this habitat and have very similar habits. This raises an important question. Will species specific control, such as that that might be implemented with a gene drive mechanism uh, by population suppression result in competitive release of a non-target vector and therefore simply trade one problem for another? This could take a couple of forms. It could be enhancement of the abundance of a non-target competitor that's already present in an area or uh, that kind of species specific suppression could 
contribute to invasion of new areas that have been vacated by species specific control by non-target competitors from nearby areas. So what I will talk about today is this in the context of two invasive species of Aedes, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Um, and I'll try and answer a few questions about these uh, two mosquitoes. First, what are their global distributions of these invasive Aedes? Uh, and how much do they overlap? Second, um, what do we know about mechanisms of interspecific competition between these two species um, and how it occurs and uh, who has the advantage? Um, a, a third question I'll address is, is that competition important in the field? It's one thing to say that it occurs, it's another to show that it influences the abundance of these mosquitoes in nature. I'll uh, describe uh, answers to the question of, do we expect competitive coexistence between these two species or competitive exclusion? And ultimately this is all directed at trying to answer the question, can each of these species occupy the other's niche? Could one replace the other if one of them was successfully uh, suppressed? And I'll, I'll uh, mention two aspects of ecological niche. The fundamental niche is uh, a description of the conditions in which a population persists in the absence of any biotic interactions. Uh, and in contrast, the realized niche is a term that defines conditions in which a population persists with whatever biotic interactions like interspecific competition might occur. Um, now, in, in terms of the uh, ecological niche of these two species, broadly speaking, they are container dwellers um, residing in things like the uh, discarded tires that you see uh, in, in the uh, image in the upper right. But when people think about Aedes albopictus, largely they would think about uh, them being a rural uh, generalist feeder that is exophilic, that is principally bites outdoors. Uh, and when people think about Aedes aegypti, they would think about it as an urban species, uh, anthropophilic, that is preferring to bite humans, and largely endophilic. As you'll see, those are oversimplifications of the ecology of these species. Um, this is a pair of maps from a really nice paper by Kramer uh, that investigated the uh, expected geographic distribution of these two species based on climate and land use. And that's what's shown in the colors, the red, white, and blue, with red being most likely to occur and blue being least. Um, and what you see is, broadly speaking, their expected suitable ranges, which you might think of as an approximation of the fundamental niche, broadly overlap across the globe. Um, there's some differences to be sure. Aedes aegypti tends to get into more arid areas like this. Uh, and Aedes albopictus tends to be predicted to be able to be more abundant in temperate zones um, like North, Northern North America. But there's a lot of overlap in where they would be expected to be able to exist. Well, the black points on this uh, pair of maps show where they do exist. These are the records of collections of these two species. And as you see, those overlap quite extensively on a geographic scale as well, with large parts of South America, a substantial portion of Southern North America, parts of West Africa, parts of India, and parts of Southeast Asia being home to both of these species. Now that's geographic overlap. That says that they're in those regions. It's also true that they occur together on a micro scale as well. These are data from Tampa, Florida, and they are um, records of sites at which either Aedes aegypti alone was found or Aedes albopictus alone was found or sites where both were found. And there are two points I wanna make about this. There's a, a pattern that shows up frequently with these two species where uh, you find aegypti most prevalent 
early in the rainy season, which in Florida starts in about June uh, and less prevalent later. And you find Albopictus more abundant or more prevalent later in the rainy season than in the early rainy season. But notice here that what you see is there are a number of sites, small sites within this metropolitan area where both species occur at the same times. And so there's a considerable overlap on a micro scale besides the broad geographic overlap. Um, we, there's been a lot of study of these two species as competitors, as two global invasives. They do occur in the same places, so people have been interested in how they might affect one another. And when most people think about interspecific competition, the first thing they would think about is resource competition. And for mosquitoes, this principally would be focused on resource competition among larvae for the food that larvae consume in the aquatic environment. Um, in the case of Aedes mosquitoes in containers, this would mostly be microorganisms that grow on uh, plant and animal detritus in the water. Resource competition theory uh, describes how consumers can take in resources and that fuels their population growth. And in doing so, each species reduces the resource availability. Uh, and models have been developed that um, describe how they will reduce that resource level to a characteristic equilibrium point at which the consumer's population growth will be zero and the resources population growth will be zero. And these models um, define then this equilibrium resource concentration and, and the term used for it is our star. And the models make a really clear prediction. Whichever species has a lower R star, that is a lower equilibrium abundance of resources that it um, uh, produces, uh, will be the better competitor and should be able to competitively exclude any species with a greater value of R star. Okay, uh, well, that's theory. Um, the uh, difficulty with it is for mosquitoes like these two Aedes, uh, those equilibrium conditions are, are likely to be kind of rare in nature. Um, and if you were attempting to assess this uh, uh, competitive ability using R star, it would be even difficult to design uh, experiments that would let the system go to equilibrium so you could get an accurate measurement of R star. Well, what we did in my lab was investigate this by uh, trying to design a short-term approach where we could do uh, an experiment in the lab and measure something that would be an approximation of that equilibrium condition, something we're going to call R index. It's not R star, but we think it's a, a good approximation. So envision an experiment where you start with a laboratory system stocked with a certain amount of uh, detritus that fuels microbial growth, and then raise um, mosquito cohorts on that um, in those environments and get an estimate from life table approaches of the rate of increase for those cohorts. And um, you might then observe uh, estimates of that rate of increase that look like the points you see on this graph. You might be able to um, fit a curve to that and uh, estimate by where that curve will pick this. Phil Unibus and his co-workers have found variation in satirization potential in both species where uh, some populations of Aedes aegypti are resistant to satirization, particularly after they encounter Albopictus. And some populations of Aedes albopictus are not very uh, good at satirizing Aedes uh, aegypti. And finally, spatial aggregation of larvae across containers um, is another mechanism by which these species may have an enhanced likelihood of coexistence in some locations. My main point of all of this discussion of coexistence is many different mechanisms can contribute to this variation that we see in what occurs, which of these two species occurs and dominates in a given location. Um, <clears throat> 
I want to get to, though, uh, this capacity for expansion of the realized niche of the two species, should one of them be reduced or removed. So um, there is considerable phenotypic variation in Aedes albopictus for its degree of anthropophily and endophily. And these are data from Rome province in Italy, where Aedes albopictus is the only species of Aedes that occupies containers. Um, and what you see in the upper graph is the number of females and the, uh, uh, the blood meal that they were identified as having taken. And what you see in urban Rome is Aedes albopictus is quite frequently feeding on humans. It is very flexible in this blood feeding choice. Um, also uh, an important part of this is what you see in the bottom graph here is that Aedes albopictus blood meals in Rome province um, are distributed a bit differently depending on where they're collected. Um, blood fed females indoors tend to be quite frequent in urban areas, suggesting that albopictus may be endophilic to some degree in urban Rome when there is no competitor present. And even in rural parts of Rome province, some 80s albopictus seem to be blood feeding indoors as well. And what this shows, I think, is a considerable range of flexibility for this species in its habits, suggesting it might be good at exploiting a vacated environment um, due to mosquito control of its competitor. Now, this is a, a similar um, um, issue for Aedes aegypti. There's considerable phenotypic variation in the degree of anthropophily and urban rural distribution in Aedes aegypti. That's particularly evident in Africa. Um, what the graph shows is African populations from across a range of countries and uh, areas some from cities that are shown in black and some from forested areas that are shown in green. Um, and all of these are compared to what's referred to as non-African reference, which is the worldwide globally invasive Aedes aegypti. And there's the main point here is there's a lot of variation in their degree of urban and human preference. Some areas, some cities have uh, Aedes aegypti populations that are uh, highly uh, disposed to prefer human blood meals in wind tunnel studies. And that's these and this one. Other uh, smaller cities in um, uh, Africa have uh, Aedes aegypti populations that um, are uh, uh, show a preference for non-human animals for blood meals. Uh, this is some work coming uh, uh, from directly a paper by Rose. Um, and uh, this is really nice work showing the range of variability and suggesting considerable genetic variation and genetic admixture of populations of Aedes aegypti in Africa and perhaps elsewhere. Um, in, in my lab, I have a doctoral student, Kate Evans, who has been working on modeling the effects of species-specific mosquito control uh, on one or another of these two species and what it might do to its competitor. These are agent-based models where individuals are tracked and individual larval mosquitoes in the models uh, feed in the aquatic environment and compete for a food resource. They acquire mass and energy from those resources, uh, reach a mass threshold, eclose, and then lay eggs back in the aquatic environment. And what um, Kate has simulated is control either targeting a superior competitor, think Aedes albopictus, or targeting an inferior competitor, think Aedes aegypti, and simulating species-specific mortality that might act early in the larval life so immediately after hatching, or late acting mortality that might kill larvae um, at the end of the larval life near pupation. And targeting the superior competitor, you see that as the percent mortality imposed increases, the um, um, abundance and um, production of adults of the uh, inferior competitor shown in yellow increases dramatically, particularly as you suppress 
uh, the greatest fraction of the superior competitor. Um, similarly, late acting mortality produces a similar effect when you impose it on the better competitor, uh, although the increase in the abundance of um, the poorer competitor is not as dramatic. Even targeting the inferior competitor with early acting mortality produces a strong enhancement in the production of the superior competitor. And this reminds us that even though we may call one of these species a superior competitor, uh, removing the inferior competitor is beneficial to that superior competitor. It removes something that's harmful to it. Um, the only case that we've seen where um, mortality targeting the inferior competitor didn't produce an increase in the abundance of the better competitor is when the mortality acts very late in larval development. Um, so back to the questions I posed at the beginning. The global distributions of these two invasive species overlap extensively. They encounter one another and are likely to affect one another. We've seen two mechanisms of competition that have been pretty well studied and established. They've both been shown to be important in the field. Uh, both uh, resource competition among larvae and satirization in the adults seems to occur in the field and has the potential to affect their abundance. We find across the globe where the two encounter one another, we get sometimes coexistence of the two in a given location, sometimes competitive exclusion of one or the other. So a wide array of possibilities, yet in single metropolitan areas, you will often have both of them present in different uh, subparts of the urban rural gradient. So can they occupy each other's niche? I think the answer is a resounding yes. They probably do frequently, uh, given the opportunity. What that means for species-specific genetic control is that removing, suppressing one population of these species may create an opportunity for niche expansion of the other. I think it's quite likely. What does that mean? Well, it might mean that if you have a choice between population suppression and population uh, replacement as an outcome of intervening with genetic control, say by a gene drive mechanism, you might prefer population replacement, wherein you would drive genes into the target population that make it uh, less likely to carry a pathogen, uh, one of the arboviruses. That leaves the competitor in place, but removes the main reason that we are worried about these mosquitoes, and that is their disease uh, transmission potential. Uh, you might consider also the possibility of pairing species-specific control of one target with an uh, auxiliary uh, approach to control like auto-dissemination of the insect growth regulator, something that's been of interest to people working on uh, traditional sterile insect technique. In auto-dissemination, the released mosquitoes might distribute a growth regulator like pyroproxifen, which kind of inhibit the uh, development of larvae in the aquatic environment if reaching a sufficient concentration and tends to be effective at really low concentrations, but doesn't seem to harm adults that do the auto dissemination. Um, another approach might be to target simultaneously both of these species with uh, genetic control. And that of course makes sense, but it does magnify the problem and probably makes the achievement of control that much more difficult and that much more expensive. Um, I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, I've had a number of graduate students and postdocs who have worked on the interaction between these two species and none of this work could have been accomplished without them. I've had uh, extensive collaborations with people at Florida Medical Entomology Lab, and that's been a very productive collaboration for me and uh, hope for them. And uh, I had collaborators for some of the Brazil work uh, with people from uh, Osvaldo Cruz in Rio de Janeiro. And of course, I have to thank the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease for support uh, over the years. And with that, I will turn the floor over to the next speaker. Thanks. That was that was a really interesting um, 
opening um, session from Steve there. Uh, and I think our uh, approach is quite a different one. And I should emphasize that our background is not in ecology. And in fact, um, I'm part of the target malaria regulatory team and very much have uh, approached this question from a risk assessment and regulatory point of view. Um, but what I want to talk about today is some work um, that I've been doing over the past year and a half with Alima Qureshi, who I see has already been busy asking questions of Steve in the chat. Um, and together we've worked on a systematic review um, to try and assess the potential for uh, release of uh, non-targeted vector species from competition uh, following insecticide-based population suppression of Anopheles species in Africa. Uh, the reason we were drawn to this um, study is in target malaria, many of you will be aware, we are interested in developing novel vector control interventions. And a frequent question that we're asked uh, when we're engaging with the outside world is, if we manage to successfully develop effective population suppression gene drive or other in interventions, um, what, what's the potential for uh, re removal or reduction in uh, Anopheles gambi, which would be our target organism? What's the potential for releasing other uh, vector species for, from competition? Uh, and so we were drawn to um, the natural experiment of investigating what's happened in the field when people have been using insecticide-based approaches to vector control. And so that's, um, that's what I want to talk about today and the, ba and the basis of our study. Um, so on the top here, I want to try and turn, um, turn, turn, turn that thought that we've had into the exam question in a simple way as possible, uh, which is important in trying to uh, develop a, as effective as possible a systematic review. So I think the question for us became, can insecticide-based uh, mosquito vector control programs that target Anopheles species in Africa uh, lead to increases in population density of non-target um, disease vectors? And in accordance with uh, PRISMA guidance, uh, who, who, where there's been uh, various criteria for systematic reviews established, um, we designed a protocol uh, with a range of inclusion and exclusion criteria and published that protocol on the Prospero uh, website for uh, international registration of uh, systematic reviews. But just to say in terms of searches, uh, we looked on three different uh, search engines uh, from inception of those engines. So that dates to 1940, right up until um, September 2020. Uh, in terms of the region, we focused on Africa only. And we were aware from our initial preliminary investigations that there are some really interesting, and we've just heard them, examples where uh, there appears to be uh, examples of uh, vector species being released from competition, but we were really keen to understand um, the lie of the land in Africa, specifically the effects on uh, Anopheles and related species, um, but also given the specific environmental uh, conditions in Africa and any impact on uh, vector control considerations in Africa. In terms of uh, what we looked at, it was a range of different studies, everything from randomized to non-randomized studies, but typically uh, interventions that involved um, before or after um, studies or um, interrupted time series studies. And um, in addition, uh, the trials with uh, uh, we picked trials which had cluster distances greater than um, two kilometers. The intervention we chose was any insecticide-based vector control because, uh, again, from our preliminary reading of the literature, uh, this was the most uh, mature form of efficient vector control and others such as larvicides were at earlier stages of development and there was less in information, particularly entomological, on, on, on their impact. 
in terms of species, uh, our inclusion and exclusion criteria called for studies that had examined an awfully species, but could also, once they had an awfully species present, examine any other um, species of uh, mosquito. And for the primary outcomes, we were interested in uh, absolute population density measurements. So what I mean by that is uh, measurements that would give a readout that would uh, reflect the absolute density of the population of mosquitoes that we were interested in. So it could include entomological inoculation rates, human biting rates, spray catches or landing catches, uh, but also um, uh, studies where the, the number of mosquitoes per person uh, per house was 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 measured um, either through uh, light traps or uh, uh, knockdown catches um, with uh, specific units of time measured um, and a maximum time interval um, of uh, 30 days between measurements. In terms of secondary outcomes, uh, we were also interested in identifying any proportional uh, population density uh, for species that had uh, already been identified in primary outcome data, but also wanted to uh, see if, if those studies also had uh, epidemiological supporting data, particularly uh, or specifically malaria incidents um, uh, and prevalence. Um, and also, uh, we uh, wanted to capture any confounding factors um, in particular, and I'll touch on this a little bit later on, uh, effects of uh, climatic change, so uh, changes in rainfall or indeed in irrigation practices, um, dam building, deforestation, urbanization over the course of the study. Um, in terms of data comparators, um, the non-intervention arm had to be in the same, effectively the same locality as the intervention arm um, uh, or pre or post intervention had to be uh, within the same locality and various criteria uh, for studies involving bed nets on the level of uptake and the number of samples um, for each, each of those studies. Um, so to cut a long story very short, um, from our searches, uh, we identified over 5,000 uh, papers uh, that reported density data on populations of uh, an Anopheli species, at least one Anopheli species, plus at least one other uh, mosquito species um, in, in uh, concomitant with um, insect -based, insecticide based vector control in Africa. And then through a series of uh, filtering processes, um, we whittled uh, those studies down to only 30, where we identified um, st statistically significant changes in population densities of at least two mosquito species, one of which was an Anopheli species. Um, we further subjected um, studies that uh, survived that process to a risk of bias assessment uh, particularly on, on data quality. And then um, of the surviving 30 studies, we further stratified them into different categories of density. So known as category D, I and ID. So category D was where all species uh, observed decreased in absolute density. And that involved 19 of the 30 studies. Um, category I was where all um, species increased in density, and that was just one of the 30 studies. And then category ID was where we observed opposing density changes in two or more uh, mosquito species. And we found 10 studies where that happened. And you can imagine um, in starting to build up this uh, systematic review and selection process, category ID was, was the class uh, of changes in density that we were interested in because it suggests that uh, one vector species is increasing in density and one is decreasing in density, at least uh, concomitant with uh, insecticide based vector control. And so we took two approaches to those uh, 30 studies. First of all, 
uh, we did a quantitative analysis just to do um, a statistical assessment for any differences between um, categories D and ID. Um, category I, but one study can't really be considered uh, and, uh, a category to engage in statistical analysis, but um, we certainly wanted to see if we could identify any uh, statistical differences in intervention type uh, insecticide resistance or malaria transmission, for instance. And then the second analysis that we did was um, of those 10 category ID studies, um, we realized that uh, because they were all quite different in terms of location, intervention type species studied, it wasn't really appropriate to do a meta-analysis on those 10. So instead we, we engaged in a, a qualitative analysis of those uh, 10 studies and we found five um, that we think provide the stronger of the evidence uh, that, that uh, at least are consistent with that insecticide use uh, resulting in competitive release of uh, non-targeted mosquito um, vector species. So I'm going to show you the overall uh, summary results from that quantitative analysis. Um, so this is uh, looking at the three categories of studies. And in fact, uh, within each study, sometimes there were a number of different disparate observations between species within those studies. And those numbers are captured here. Uh, but we compared uh, the intervention type. So whether it was uh, bed nets or um, uh, indoor spraying or indeed other, other interventions that we observed in some cases that were insecticide based. Uh, we also looked at insecticide uh, type, insecticide resistance, uh, malaria transmission, and the collection methods, whether um, they were indoor, outdoor, or both. Uh, and the, the, the short answer is we didn't uh, uh, find any difference between any of these uh, categories. Um, using adjusted statistical tests to take into account that we were doing repeated tests from the same sample data with the exception of uh, pyrethroids where um, they were associated with cat category ID. Uh, but in terms of the other things that we looked at like malaria transmission, we didn't see any statistical association between uh, whether there was an increase or decrease in malaria transmission and whether uh, something was uh, category D or ID. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is just uh, describe some of the studies where we found some of the most intriguing evidence around um, uh, density data that might be consistent with, with uh, uh, competitive releases as a result of um, insecticide-based factor control. Um, so the, uh, before I do that, um, even though category ID, uh, as I've defined it, where, where we have opposing uh, changes in, in, in the density of um, two vector species, I think there's a number of uh, scenarios to consider on how um, such changes could occur. Um, that should help us to divine whether we think a study is uh, compelling or not, and what other information we might need to support uh, examination of that study. So um, the first category here uh, shows differential effects on species from uh, insecticide use uh, with release from competition. So I have two vectors here. One is named V and the other D. and uh, I, I, you might want to imagine V as uh, an Ophelis gambi um, uh, and the intervention, some insecticide, and that you can see the post-intervention, uh, you get a reduction in, uh, you get a reduction in uh, one of the vectors and an expansion in the size of the density of the, of the population um, as a result of, of uh, the reduction in V. Um, so that's a pretty str straightforward case you'd imagine where you have some release from competition. You can imagine some more complex um, situations uh, where you could have um, 
some effects that I think we might be considering in, late, in later um, talks in this series, but um, apparent competition effects where um, those comp apparent competitive effects on uh, V and D are being mediated uh, through, in this case, a predator. Um, and as a result of the insecticide-based reduction in V, um, one sees an increase in D. Um, so in either case, uh, either apparent or um, direct competition, um, the same effects could occur between uh, both vector species. And then a third possibility is um, the potential impact that an insecticide resistance could play on differential uh, effects on the density of those two species. So you can imagine um, species specific insecticide resistance uh, with release from competition. Now, if you, if you think about insecticide resistance, um, when you have a pre-intervention situation where you've got um, the greater size population of a vector suppressing or um, inhibiting through competition D, and D has some insecticide resistance, um, once the intervention occurs and, and V is reduced, um, you can imagine uh, D um, with insecticide resistance not responding to um, the insecticide, but in the absence of competition, one shouldn't expect insecticide resistance to result in an increase in uh, the population of D. So one needs to invoke some sort of mechanism in addition to the insecticide resistance. Uh, and in this case, it would be uh, a release from competition playing into the uh, population dynamics. But you can also imagine uh, another situation that doesn't require um, competitive release, and that's where um, post-intervention you have an increase in resources that are uh, equally available to both D and V, but because V has been uh, targeted by the insecticide, uh, the population of D expands primarily as a result of the increase in uh, resources. And um, so in this, in this particular case, one could imagine increase in say rainfall, allowing a, a greater amount of aquatic habitats to exist. Um, and in fact, one doesn't even need to invoke insecticide resistance for such um, an effect to occur. Anyway, all of this, um, consideration as some scenarios around where we might think about how we could get category ID changes, opposing changes in, um, in vector uh, species density, uh, helps us to think that uh, what we should be focusing on are changes in competition or indeed apparent competition, but also importantly, we um, should be considering uh, potential effects of changes in aquatic resources. So I'm going to start showing you some um, studies that we pulled out where we, um, where we thought we saw um, significant changes in, in different uh, vector species. So this is a study um, from uh, Russell et al. Uh, in 2011, but also drawing on uh, data from an earlier publication and indeed from a PhD thesis and another study uh, that, that also uh, produced some uh, proportional density data from the same study location. And using uh, all of that data, we were able to um, calculate absolute density measurements uh, as, uh, as um, measured in bytes per person per night uh, in 2004 versus 2009. Um, when there was rollout of insecticide treated bed nets in this Tanzanian area in 2006. Before the intervention, uh, Anopheles Gambi SS was uh, by far uh, the most predominant uh, vector in the area and uh, Arabiensis um, uh, showed very little density by this measurement. However, after the 2006 rollout, uh, there was a complete reversal in the density data uh, for uh, Arabiensis compared to Gambi. Um, and the authors also um, examined 
uh, changes in species composition and didn't find any statistical association between those changes and uh, rainfall patterns. Um, this is another study where the effect is not as striking, but nonetheless um, significant. Um, and it also shows replacement of Anopheles gambi, or at least is consistent with replacement of Anopheles gambi with Arabiensis uh, following the um, implementation of insecticide treated bed nets in Kenya in 2006. And again, using an absolute density measurement of females per house per night. Uh, and what they found was that uh, introduction of, of the bed nets caused substantial reduction in the absolute density of Gambi SS. But they also found uh, a six-fold increase in the density of Arabiensis that again uh, was not attributed to uh, climatic parameters that they measured, including, including rainfall. And this is a third study um, from Sugufara et al. Uh, it, uh, following the implementation of long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets in Senegal in 2008. Um, and what they found here on this graph, you can see the striped, uh, the striped um, column represents Anopheles caluzzi, which was the major uh, malaria vector in the area before the intervention. And also present uh, was the lighter dotted column here, Anopheles gambi SS and uh, Anopheles uh, arabiensis um, at, at lower densities than Caluzzi. Um, but upon implementation of uh, the bed nets, uh, there was a significant reduction in the density of Caluzzi um, as well as Gambi, and then this was associated with a striking increase in the density of uh, Anopheles arabiensis. Uh, and in fact, that was um, also concomitant with, uh, despite this increase in arabiensis, a reduction in malaria incident in over, over 15s, which was mirrored to a similar extent in under 15s, going from about 28% in 2006 till after implementation, 9% in 2008. And at the same time, um, Sugufara et al. found uh, when, they, when they looked at rainfall records, in fact, uh, rainfall had increased in um, 2008 compared to 2006, uh, which you would have predicted from the biology would in fact favor Caluzzi and Gambi um, uh, Arabiensis uh, preferring drier conditions. Um, so this uh, was again at least consistent with the idea that uh, Ara Arabiensis was replacing uh, Caluzzi. There was a slight change in um, the data uh, two years after uh, the 2008 data where there was a somewhat resurgence in um, the density of Gambi and a somewhat reduced uh, density of Arabiensis, but Arabiensis still was the major um, vector in the area. Uh, and the authors attributed this, or at least linked it to um, a reduction in bed net usage um, or potentially linked to a reduction in bed net usage that was recorded in the area. Uh, and also um, speculated on the fact that um, insecticide resistance in Anopheles Gambi was recorded in the area at, at the time. Uh, and this is just to um, draw draw together some of the some of the studies that we've seen on um, Anopheles Gambi and and the species in this complex. This is another study from Bayo et al. in, in 2010. And um, what they found was when they looked at uh, insecticide treated bed net use in two different areas, uh, neighboring areas in, in Kenya, uh, Sembo and Semi, uh, they found opposing density changes in uh, Anopheles Gambi and Arabiensis. So, in Assembo, um, over a period between 95 and 2009, uh, right from 96 
onwards, there was a rapid uptake in bed net usage in Assembo, so that by 1999, about 90% of households were using uh, ITNs. Uh, however, um, at that same period, uh, there was still no, almost no bed net usage in uh, SEMI. And even by 2003, uh, there was still only about 30% uh, bed net usage in SEMI. At the same time, over this same period, uh, there was an increase in the proportion uh, of uh, Anopheles uh, arabiensis and a decline in the relative proportion of um, Gambi SS. And indeed, when the authors looked in 2003 at transect samples, looking at the um, larval density of uh, Anopheles Gambi in Assembo, where there was uh, high bed net coverage versus semi where it was lower, they found uh, that larval density was significantly reduced in it of Gambi was significantly reduced in assembly compared to SEMBI. And in fact, uh, linked to those density measurements, the proportion of um, Gambi SS uh, was, was much higher in uh, SEMBI where, uh, where, there where there was less bed net usage. So again, all uh, supporting and consistent with the idea um, that you can have these opposing effects on Arabiensis and Gambi SS as a result of insecticide use. Um, I'd also like to mention another um, study uh, from, a, from a different era and involving a different um, species complex. And that was uh, the study of uh, Gillies and Smith from 1960, uh, where they looked at um, the impact, the entomological impact of um, indoor residual spraying with Deldron in 1955 and the impact on absolute density. In this case, it was uh, their, their measure of absolute density was the average number of mosquitoes in outdoor um, traps per day per month. Uh, and what they found was that uh, before the IRS intervention in November uh, uh, 55, um, there were uh, seasonally changing but consistently higher population densities of Anopheles finestus um, with some uh, background levels of uh, uh, Anopheles rubulorum. After uh, implementation of IRS, they didn't find a single sample of Anopheles finestus in the next uh, more than two years. And instead, they observed uh, substantial increases in the density of Rufulorum that, again, persisted over um, more than two years that, in which they looked. Um, at the same time, uh, they didn't report any changes, or they, they reported no changes observed in rainfall or irrigation conditions. And likewise, um, they, they reported over this time as well that uh, malaria transmission reduced. Uh, so before I conclude, I, I do want to emphasize a number of limitations of this analysis. I have some here, I'm sure, I'm sure there are others. Um, so what we've done as it's a systematic review, we know it's an observational and non-experimental approach. So there's the, the data that we have is extremely limited. Um, we're also aware that um, some of the collection methods for some studies uh, would potentially favor certain species because um, certain species would uh, prefer to be indoors um, uh, over, say, outdoor collection methods. Uh, at the very least, from our quantitative analysis of the three different categories, we didn't see any uh, association between category and indoor or outdoor collection methods. Um, but we're, we also should be aware that um, there's an inherent heterogeneity in larval densities in, in aquatic habitats in the field, which could have a, a, an impact on some of the field observations that, that we're, we're talking about here. Um, and also the competitive releases uh, or the effects that we've seen here uh, on uh, species densities could vary temporarily 
in response to other factors. Uh, so even though they may occur, but they could still change. For example, uh, in that Sugufara as our example, where they, they saw a decrease in bed net usage uh, when, um, when the human population started to see reductions in Anopheles gambi. Uh, another, another potential limitation, or you could say strength, depending on your viewpoint, is that uh, we excluded non-African studies. So there are examples that we know of uh, that are often cited as examples of uh, competitive releases elsewhere in the world, uh, like this example in Italy. Uh, but once again, we were keen to try and explore the species um, relevant to Africa. And then finally, uh, because we've um, done a systematic review doesn't mean uh, we've got a grasp on how representative um, the situations that we're highlighting here are. And I was really struck by Steve's talk about the different potential levels of interaction that can occur between the two species he was talking about. And so um, even to use the term representative is a very simplistic way to talk about it because I guess there are many different conditions and scenarios to consider. Um, uh, so with all those caveats in mind, uh, I think um, the conclusions that, uh, that we've reached, um, going back to the original exam question, um, can insecticide-based vector control targeting anopheles species in Africa lead to um, increases in the population density of non-targeted vector species? Um, well, we think they can. Um, uh, I would point out that um, in addition to the non-African studies that people have talked about in the literature in the past, um, I think we adopted relatively high stringency um, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And that meant that some studies that people might be familiar with uh, as examples of, um, as potential examples of competitive releases like Julie's and Furlong uh, from uh, 64, where similar to the um, previous study I mentioned on uh, Rivularum, uh, Fenestis was uh, apparently replaced by uh, another species of, uh, um, of, uh, from the Fenestis complex. Um, but I think one conclusion uh, from at least the data that we've seen is that um, competitive species replacing um, the targeted Anopheles species in the examples we looked at were invariably sibling species uh, and were all reported to share the aquatic habitats of the targeted vector, at least um, to some degree of overlap. Uh, the other conclusion was that, uh, I guess, related to the sibling species effect is that uh, in, in all of the cases that we looked at, highly effective malaria vectors were replaced by less efficient um, vectors of malaria transmission. Uh, we didn't find any evidence for competitive release, release of species outside um, the Anopheles uh, genus. Um, and in studies where it was measured uh, in those category ID studies, um, despite uh, increases in um, non-targeted vector species, uh, the indicators of malaria transmission still decreased. Um, however, it's certainly feasible that um, competitive uh, replacement could contribute to uh, aspects of residual transmission after the use of insecticides. So it's probably something that should be considered as part of integrated uh, vector management strategies against malaria in Africa. And then finally, from our own um, very selfish point of views, in thinking about novel uh, vector control interventions, um, it's going back to the to why, why we did this study in the first place. Uh, you would guess that it's, it's reasonable to conclude that novel interventions could also lead to increases in densities of um, vectors that share larval habitats or, or predators in the case of parent competition. Um, but on the evidence we've seen, 
you, you'd still, uh, with an effective vector control intervention, uh, anticipate reducing malaria and overall um, burden of disease. Um, so just in terms of acknowledgements, I'd really like to thank Alima uh, Qureshi, uh, who I've been working with on this uh, for about a year and a half. Um, she's been absolutely brilliant and uh, in terms of thinking and work ethic uh, has been an absolute joy to work with. But I'd also like to thank all of these people who are part of the Target Malaria Consortium for um, sharing thoughts and ideas with us over the course of the um, project. Uh, and we also, uh, like Steve, we have to uh, and are grateful to thank our, um, our funders. And I'd like to thank you um, for your attention. And I guess um, we can open the floor up now to uh, a discussion. Great. Th thanks, John. And, and thanks, Steve, uh, for your presentation as well. And uh, Yes, we, we are open for questions, and we do have a, a few in the, that have come in from our, uh, from our attendees. And I think I'll just get right to them in the interest of time. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take these pretty much in order. Uh, so, Steve, a couple of these questions up, up front are for you. And uh, uh, one from Alima, uh, John's collaborator. Uh, have there been any uh, triggers identified that that disturb coexistence or prompt competitive exclusion, for example, farming, irrigation changes, urbanization? Um, yeah, yeah. The, uh, I think the general thinking would be that increased urbanization um, would tend to push systems in the direction of favoring Aedes aegypti. Um, I offhand, uh, couldn't give you a particular reference for a study that has documented that as, an, as urbanization has proceeded, but um, I think that would be um, likely. Um, the other thing that may be involved is aspects of climate change may shift this as well. Um, if, if an area is becoming due to um, Due, due to the effects of global climate change, more arid, which happens in some areas, that might tend to push the system in the direction of Aedes aegypti. Um, similarly, if an area is becoming wetter, um, that might push the system in, or, or more uh, becoming wetter would push the system in the direction of Aedes albopictus. So um, I think uh, those, things that I talked about that influence the likelihood of coexistence or exclusion could be looked at as preliminary hypotheses about what is likely to happen with land use change as human uh, domination of the environment proceeds and also with climate change. Yeah, um, I, I guess to follow up on that, um, what about the, the impact of, of uh, vector control on Aedes aegypti albopictus relationships? Um, I, yeah. I guess the controls that are in place now are probably relatively nonspecific, but mm -hmm. what would you, th how do you think about some of the ones that are specific? For example, the Wolbachia IIT. Um, yeah. uh, I think most of, most of what I was talking about really it depends more on the species specificity of the approach rather than the particular technology that's being used. So I would, my guess would be that um, an intervention of traditional SIT that is species specific for whichever of the two is being released would be likely to produce in, in a broad sense, a similar competitive release effect as would a gene drive mechanism or as would Wolbachia. Um, although the Wolbachia, uh, Wolbachia are full of surprises. So I guess, uh, I guess I'm not as sure about that, but I think this, one of the things that, that strikes me about this is that the, the, the specificity of the target of affecting only the target organism is I think what's important. What it amounts to is these kinds of approaches to mosquito control are uh, a big scale, um, 
a removal experiment that is going to affect uh, interacting species. And in the case of Egypti and Albopictus, we know a lot about how they have affected one another when they have met because of their widespread introduction. So I, I, I'm less convinced that the particular mechanism of species specific control is what's important and more convinced that it's about the species specificity. Yep. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to jump down to a question that is actually directed to both of you. So, cause I do want to um, make sure we, we get some responses from, from both of you. Uh, Hector Kamada asks a, a question that is, um, uh, he says, you have shown evidence that excluding or removing one species can allow another species to increase, but from the perspective of a risk assessment, um, we would want to know if there are harmful effects resulting from this change. Um, and so the question is, how, how strong is the evidence for the prevalence of such effects, such as increased disease or adver adverse ecological effects? So, uh, uh, Steve, I'll give I was you the gonna first. say, I'll let John take the lead. Okay, on. okay, we'll let John go first. Uh, go ahead, John. Uh, <laughs> So I think it's a, it's a really important, obviously, I would say that from a regulatory team point of view, that it's a really important question, because what do these changes mean? And um, I think that, that that was the point I was trying to make, particularly about sibling species, at least from the evidence that we have. If it's the case that uh, it seems to be, um, and you can easily justify why it makes sense that sibling species are the ones released from competition, then in terms of the Anopheles Gambi complex, um, I mean, it's Gambi, SS and Caluzzi that are um, the most significant uh, malaria vectors within the species complex so that any sibling species replacing are either, you know, much more zoophilic or less significant or very geographically restricted um, disease vectors or not disease vectors at all. Um, so that was that was a an, one of the most interesting observations for me um, in terms of implications for population suppression of, of Anopheles Gambi itself. That it it sort of leads to a, um, a, an idea for the risk assessment that you're. Uh, even with um, the potential for release from competition, uh, you're not introducing greater risk of disease transmission. The evidence on uh, malaria transmission linked to the entomological data we have, uh, uh, we're able to look at was quite limited, I, I admit, but, but that's how I would interpret it in terms of risk. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll follow that up by just noting that um, for 80s Egypti and 80s Albopictus, they are competent for many of the same arboviruses. Um, uh, and it, it may well be that for a variety of reasons, 80s Egypti is a greater uh, threat as a vector than 80s Albopictus. And so eliminating uh, Egypti, if it allowed Albopictus to increase, um, there may be a benefit to that because you've traded a more dangerous vector for a less dangerous vector. Um, it seems to me, though, that if, if the goal is um, not just an incremental improvement in the disease situation and disease transmission, but a real uh, dramatic reduction in disease transmission to justify uh, a, a major effort for species specific mosquito control that you'd wanna go beyond that incremental reduction in disease transmission and try and do something that produces a major decrease. So um, we may be finding out fairly soon uh, the likelihood of that because there are an increasing number of cases where either by SIT or some kind of genetically modified mosquito people are trying to uh, target specifically Aedes aegypti. And in the short term, we may find out if um, 
80s, albopictus increases, and if that does anything to disease transmission. Interestingly enough, a couple of the areas where I know there are active programs of this kind of species-specific mosquito control in Florida in particular, they're not areas with massive uh, arboviral disease transmission problems. It is more um, uh, smaller scale uh, problems of uh, imported dengue and a few locally transmitted cases. Um, it, it may well be that there would be an incremental improvement by, um, uh, by these approaches, even if uh, there is niche replacement, if a uh, worse vector is removed. Yeah. There was can, I, a... can I just follow up yeah, on, go ahead, John. One, yeah, further, one further thought I had as, as, um, as Steve was speaking, and that, I, uh, of course, I should emphasize that although uh, I said at the beginning, oh, so we've decided to look at this natural experiment of insecticide use, of course, as a vector control tool, it is, it is still quite different from what we'd expect from population suppression gene drive. And probably one of the most salient differences in terms of this discussion on risk assessment and then how, how that will all play out is we'd probably expect different things from population suppression gene drive in particular um, anything we thought about where we'd expect the target organisms um, to include um, sibling species so once it went in from a release with um, Caluzzi or Gambi SS um, even through low level of hybridization we'd expect homing and spread of the transgene so you would have a different portfolio of um, species effects. Um, so it, it's it's not and it's not a completely analogous situation to try and infer everything from insecticide um, based vector control. And John raises another really interesting point. Um, I don't know the extent to which um, uh, or the the degree of gene exchange between the cryptic species of uh, the Anopheles, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of likelihood of gene exchange between Aegypti and Albopictus, and hence the species specificity will be quite um, precise, I, I think. Mm -hmm. Steve, you mentioned uh, some of the genetic control programs as being, uh, you know, uh, essentially experiments where uh, this release phenomenon could be um, observed or, or, or tested. And there's a comment in the chat uh, about uh, the Oxitec uh, uh, product that uh, I don't have the reference what was included in it, but it mentions that uh, in Panama, the use of that uh, product did not result in an increase in albopictus. Um, in that suppressed area. So I'm not familiar with that. Um, I, I, I have actually, I've seen the paper, um, yeah. but at least I know of one paper that reports that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, if, if I've learned anything about these two species over my years of working with them, is, is that as that map I showed indicates, you can get lots of different results for these two species about how their ecology plays out in mm. different geographic areas at different times. And so mm. I, I'm not surprised that there will be, that there might be cases where you could remove one of the species via successful uh, gene drive um, control mechanisms and not have an increase of the other. My suspicion though, is that you will find cases where it will and um, it, it presents a challenge to the people who want to implement this is how do you uh, evaluate what's going to happen at the particular location where uh, this is going to be implemented? Yeah. I'm going to, uh, uh, Greg Lanzaro uh, uh, shares a comment, which I'll, um, which I'll read. Um, thanks, Greg, for the comment. Um, Exophilic, the comment is exophilic uh, anopheles species are much more difficult to control using IRS and ITNs than endophilic species. Uh, this should be factored into thinking um, uh, about the impact of replacing a so-called primary with a secondary one. Um, anyway, so thanks for that. I, um, I, I agree with that very much, sir. Right, and and thanks to the, uh, to the attendee who provided the... Uh, 
the the reference uh, for for that. Uh, it was uh, Gorman et al. in Pest Management in 2016 for the uh, Oxitec um, uh, data that we were just referring to. So I see we're at the end of our, our time. Uh, we got through most of the questions, I think, uh, and addressed uh, most of the issues. Uh, Phil, Phil Lunibus, I'll just get to, he, he made a, a comment. I'll just read it uh, just for, the, for those who may not have seen it. And he says that the results of uh, Valerio et al. that, that Steve uh, mentioned um, uh, represent further support for the hypothesis advanced by Lunibus and Giuliano in 2018 that Aedes albopictus will become more anthropophilic and endophilic in the absence of competing Aedes aegypti. Uh, these results have important ramifications for genetic control applied to aegypti at sites where these two species coexist. So, so that's you know it's an interesting uh, comment because it, it does it does get to uh, uh, issues of 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 risk. And uh, so anyway, thanks Phil for the comment. Um, so we're going to. Uh, uh, start to wrap it up here now. And what I'd like to do is just uh, say a few words um, <clears throat> about our upcoming uh, uh, webinar series that we're just beginning today. And to mention that it will continue uh, this series next week uh, at the same time and same place. Uh, the theme next week will be um, broadly speaking on non-target effects and predator-prey competitor interactions. We have two speakers. Um, the first speaker will really be talking about sort of an analog situation of um, thinking about non-target effects and, and how those are considered uh, when doing classical biological control. Uh, the second speaker will, will again explore more aspects of Anopheles ecology and its role in uh, the food web. So with that, I'd like to uh, extend my, uh, you know, my thanks to John and Steve for, for participating in this webinar series and for really interesting presentations and uh, uh, very, very useful and engaging. So thanks again, John and Steve for doing that. Thank you to the attendees for attending, and we hope that you will see you back here next week. And with that, I'll say, uh, have a nice day. Thank you, bye. Thanks, and thank you for the invitation. This was uh, a lot of fun and very interesting. Yes, thank you. I enjoyed it, and I learned a lot too. Thanks. Very good. And with that, I'll close the meeting. <laughs>